And then of course we need government policy change. And that's the hardest part, right? Because yeah. you know, people go to Washington, it's a shit show and you know, nothing's gonna change. Yeah. And I'm just, I give up and like, it's just, but you know, there is, there are things getting done and there, and there is a way to change things. And, and, and the people you elect do care about getting reelected mm -hmm. and they want your vote. And if they know that you care about stuff, they will change things. They'll change it. They will change things. They want to be in power. Yes, they want they to, want be to stay power. there. So we, 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 we can actually be active. Welcome back, everyone, to the School of Greatness podcast. We've got the man, Dr. Mark Hyman, in the house. Good to see you, man. Good to see you, too. Super pumped you're here. I think you've been on twice before. Yes, I have. This is the third time. Yes, trifecta. And you are arguably the leading expert on all things health, nutrition, and an amazing doctor as well at the Cleveland Clinic. So thanks for being here. I'm super excited about this. You've got a mission that you're on, which is to change the food system. Yep. Not just, <laughs> not just teaching people how to eat better, yeah. but actually changing the whole system of what's actually legal and not legal on what we can eat, I guess, or what's, yeah. what we as Americans can have at stores and what, what we, we buy. grow, what we produce, what we process, what we market, what we eat, what we waste. The whole food chain is messed up. It's really messed up. <laughs> it's messed up. Well, there's a lot of sick people, especially in the U.S. Right? Yes. How many people are, are oh, it's sick? Terrible. And what it, do we, what do we categorize as sick? Like, that's a great question. So what's obese? What's sick? What's so at the, at the top level, we have to understand that over the last 40 years, a tsunami has come that we weren't aware was coming, that we weren't prepared for, and still haven't grappled with. And that tsunami is chronic disease and food-related illness. In 40 years? In 40 years. Did we have chronic disease prior to this? We did, of course we did, but not to the magnitude. We used to have like 5% obesity rates in this country in the early 60s. It's 40% now in most states. I thought it was like 30 like a nope, few years ago. Nope, nobody, nope. It's like 40%. Many states are 40% and many are just pushing 40. So it's 35 to 40, depending on where you look at it. Like California's probably less, Colorado's right, right. less, but Mississippi and Alabama right, right. are, you know, four, 40 plus. So we, ha we have six out of every 10 Americans who's got a chronic illness, four to 10 who have more than one. By 10 years from now, we're gonna have 83 million with three or more chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, cancer, dementia, you name it. We are uh, having 11 million people, and this is I think a conservative estimate, 11 million people around the world die every year from bad food, from ultra processed food and not enough good food. Now, I think it's more like 50 million when you look at all the related mm -hmm. conditions and so forth. It's a staggering number that beats out smoking Mm. War, violence, accidents, you name it, nothing else comes close. Not malaria, TB, AIDS, all that is a fraction, a third of, of the deaths that are caused by chronic illness. And they're mostly preventable, and they're mostly caused by food, and they're mostly caused by the ultra-processed food that our food system produces en masse. It's the biggest industry on the planet. It's $15 trillion, about 17% of the world's global product, and it is controlled by a few dozen CEOs really? that are in monopolies around seed production, agrochemicals, fertilizer, processed food companies. It's, it's staggering how the system wow. has sort of just over the last 40 years completely transformed. And you know, I, you know, I remember like I was, I, was in this, I was in some store or <laughs> cafe and I saw this picture of Woodstock. And I'm looking at the, all the sea of people. And in the 60s, right? 69. There wasn't one overweight person. I watched this movie, I think it was called Amazing Grace, about Aretha Franklin, African-American church. Now, African-Americans, 80% of African-American women are overweight. Uh, it is, you know, they're- 80% today? 80%. Why, why is that? Uh, well, because they're targeted by the food industry, because they're in a vicious cycle of, of economic stress, of social stress, of, of unfair targeting um, and manipulation by the food industry. This is well documented by, for example, studies from Yale where they look at the amount of advertising and targeting right. to, to poor and African-American, Hispanic communities, it's staggering. And, and there was not one overweight person in this sea of African-Americans in 1970. Yeah. And so it's literally just happened. And I'm, I was 11 years old in 1970. Yeah. And in my lifetime, you know, you see this change. 
So we have this staggering problem of, of chronic illness, which people suffer from that's bankrupting people, that's bankrupting our country. I mean, think about the amount of economic stress. We talk about- Well, insurance you know, too. I mean, so much insurance money that's involved in this too. People are having to go to the doctor so much more probably now because of these issues, right? Absolutely, people, and then many people are not adequately covered. So there's a lot of co-pays. I mean, you know, people can have 10, $20,000 in co-pays. I had a patient the other day who, you know, had diabetes and I, I fixed his diabetes through food and he says, I saved ten thousand dollars a year wow. on co-pays for my insulin <laughs> and my <laughs> like just the drugs. Yeah. And yeah. when you look at the amount on diabetes spent in this country, which is basically one out of every two Americans has pre diabetes or type two diabetes, one third of Medicare spending is on diabetes. One you third know. of Medicare is on and, diabetes. Yeah. Medicare, if it was a company, it would be the biggest company in the world, a trillion dollar budget a year. <laughs> Shut <laughs> up. Yes. One third of our total federal tax revenue expected to grow to 100% of our mandatory spending by 2048. And in six years, Lewis, six years, the Medicare trust fund, which is sort of the bank account that we use to make sure uh -huh. we cover Medicare, it's a little complicated how it works, but the Medicare trust fund is gonna be out of money. So that means that we're gonna to have to get a trillion dollars a year out of uh, our tax revenue. We're not covering it. Oh so my this, gosh. Is a, this is a threat to our economy. It's a threat to our political stability. It's a threat even to national security, Lewis, because seven out of 10 kids who apply for the military get can't rejected. Get, can't get in? Because they're too fat or unfit no to fight. Way. Yes, it's a, it's a, there's a 700 admirals and generals that published a report called Unhealthy and Unprepared about the threat in our military and national security. And not only that, soldiers are overweight. So we're feeding them crap. They go in Iraq and Afghanistan, the number one reason for for uh, medical evacuations was not war injury, was obesity-related no, problems. come yes, on. Yes, 100%. Obesity-related problem. What does that mean? Like they're injury, like a heart uh, injury, problem? Injuries or? from being overweight. Wow. You know? and, and you can read about this. I didn't make this shit up. I right. mean, <laughs> I mean, this is in, in that wow. report, Unhealthy and Unprepared. Just Google it, you can read it yourself. Wow. It's staggering. So we have, we have a you know, $22 trillion debt. Uh, we have um, you know, this threat of chronic disease exploding. It's getting worse and worse. Uh, Medicare for all is kind of a silly idea, and so is repealing Obamacare. Now they're going to help the problem unless we figure out how to stop people from going into the system in the first place. Into the system, meaning, of meaning getting unhealthy. Yeah, if they don't need medical care, it's right. cheap, you know. So let's go back to diabetes for a second. Tell me again the stat on diabetes: how many people have yeah. it or are okay. pre-diabetic, and yes. and what? I'm uneducated on this, so how many different types of diabetes are there okay, and good. how is it caused? Okay, okay. So type 1 diabetes is an autoimmune disease. Pancreas fails, it's called, we used to be called juvenile diabetes, uh, and you need insulin. It's just, it's, you need it. It's, you need insulin. If you have type you, 1 diabetes, you need insulin. You need insulin, yeah. Because your what? pancreas dies, because your pancreas makes insulin and helps your blood sugar uh, get balanced, keeps, that's the blood, it's sort of the gatekeeper that lets the, the glucose into your cells. Okay. So it's really important. Um, so how does that die? What, how, what how do people has, die from that? I mean, how does the pancreas die? Oh, well, it's an how does it get to that point? It's an auto, like an auto, like you get multiple sclerosis or gotcha. arthritis. It's, it's basically your body attacks your pancreas. Is that and, from and, eating a lot of bad foods? Uh, well, there's been links to dairy and actually as an, a driver wow. of type 1 uh, diabetes. Gluten, 29% of people who have type 1 diabetes have celiac that are undiagnosed. So wow. celiac is a big cause of autoimmune diseases, okay. including type 1 diabetes. So that's a very small number of people, okay. very few. Um, one out of two Americans have what we call type 2 diabetes. We used to call it adult onset, except now kids as young as three are getting type 2 diabetes from drinking soda from the crib. I mean, oh Lewis, my gosh. I, I, was, I was working in, when I was a resident in an urgent care center, and this woman comes in for back pain, and she's got her baby in a carriage, and I see her feeding this baby this brown liquid in a bottle who's seven months old. And I'm like, what is soda? that? Soda? I'm like, what is that? She said, that's Coca-Cola. No. I said, why are you feeding your baby Coke? She said, well, uh, he likes it. Oh my gosh. Oh my God, Lewis, I, my wife showed me this, this uh, video on, on, uh, on social media the other day. It was of a baby, it looked like it was maybe eight or nine months old baby, having ice cream for the first time. Oh. Having sugar for the first time. And you watch the baby eat the ice cream. A light out. The eyes, <laughs> and then the baby like grabs the thing and like stuffs in his face. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it was just so crazy. And it's, it's highly addictive. So. Uh, yeah, so, so now we're seeing one in two Americans suffer from either pre-diabetes or type 2 or type two diabetes. And, and that is when you eat wow. too much sugar and starch 
And every time you do that, it raises your insulin. Your body becomes resistant to the insulin, and so it doesn't work as well, so you need more insulin. Mm -hmm. And insulin does what? Insulin makes you hungry, it makes you store belly fat, it locks the fat in the fat cells, and it slows your metabolism. It's like a quadruple threat for your body to gain weight. So it's why we're seeing, you know, and that goes back to what we're growing, right? So why are we eating all this food? That it's because that's the food we produce, mm -hmm. right? And, and so that's the other part of the problem. So we have the chronic disease, we have the economic impact, and then we're like, well, why do we have this food? So as a functional medicine doctor, I'm always asking why, right? Well, why are my patients sick? Because it makes money, right? Well, no, I'm, yeah, but, but I'm going right, even right. further. Why, like, why I got interested sick? in this? Because as a, why would a doctor care about agriculture and soil and all this crap? Because I, as I was thinking about my patients' diseases, most of them were caused by food and can be cured by food. Mm. So I'm thinking, well, well if it's how many, are, how many are most of them? Is this like 50%, 70%? 80%. 70%. 80% of anyone either, that comes in to the hospital, yeah. or your patients, yeah. who has patient. some type of disease or yeah. some type of sickness. I mean, unless it's like an environmental thing like mercury or lime or mold, you know, most of the or things. Or cancer. Cancer, right. cancer is caused by food. Really? 70%. 70% of cancer is caused by food. And sugar is the number one culprit. Heart can, disease, can, diabetes, Alzheimer's, heart disease, the big killers. Are now, by sugar and food. Yes. yes. So if you change your diet, you should be able to cure, prevent, those. prevent. Or cure sometimes. Sometimes like, cure, depends how yeah. far along things are, I yeah. guess. Yeah. But you can prevent heart disease, Alzheimer's. 100%. Yes, 100%. I mean, the studies are there. It's crazy. Even people already have Alzheimer's when they improve their diet, they can wake they get up more and more functionality yeah. back. So, so you've got me thinking, okay, well, if the patient's disease are caused by food, what's causing the food? It's the food system. And I'm like, well, what's causing the food system? It's our food policies. Mm. Like, what's causing our food policies? It's the food industry that's lobbying Congress. It's got money. It's the biggest lobby group in Congress is agriculture and food. food. By far. Like, by twice as much as the next uh, lobby group. By like gas and oil or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. And it's like, what? So then I began thinking, well, if I'm going to help my patients, I can't do it in my office. I, I can, it's like, it's like I'm, I'm like in the boat, bailing the boat with a hole instead of plugging the hole. Right. You're not so, going to the source. Right. So then I'm thinking, okay, well, what do I need to do as a functional medicine doctor? I need to go to the root cause, right? The root cause and why. And then it became clear to me that it's, it's our, our agricultural system that's driving so much of the problem. And, and the, what we grow has been based on good intentions that were in the 50s and people were hungry, there wasn't enough food, there was a lot of poverty. And so we, we figured out a system to produce an abundance mm -hmm. of starchy calories. So we can have food. So we can starve. have food. And we were great cheap. at it. And we, we have cheap, abundant corn and wheat and soy, which are the commodity crops that are turned into industrial processed food, which is now 60% of our diet. And for every 10% of that you eat, your risk of death goes up by 14%. Yeah, so you're, Crazy. so you're basically you know, feeding Americans a diet that we know is going to kill them. The research is so clear on this. There's no scientific debate, and yet we don't do anything about it because we have these dysfunctional food policies. And then the way we grow the food causes climate change. And we'll get into that, but the number one cause of climate change is our food system. Really? People don't realize that. I didn't know it. I'm like, right. oh, it's oil and you know, gas and all this stuff. I'm like, well, what is it? Is it the trucking? Is it the animal feces? End to end. Is it okay, the... so first of all, deforestation is devastating. Uh -huh. Not only do we like destroy the soil on which we cut down the trees, but the trees are carbon sinks, so we lose that. So they're not sucking in the bad air. They're not sucking and putting in the carbon out good dioxide, air. right? I mean, basically, plants suck out carbon dioxide. That's yeah. what they breathe. We breathe oxygen. They breathe carbon dioxide. So they're the perfect antidote, right? Yeah. And then. The soil also, we're damaging by the way we're farming. Mm -hmm. We've lost a third of our topsoil. Mm. It's responsible, and people don't know this, but of all the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, the loss of soil, organic matter, like healthy, rich soil, is responsible for 30 to 40% of all greenhouse gases currently in the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution. Does that mean, why is that? Does okay, it like why? suck because, up? Does because, it suck? because soil is, it can hold more carbon than is in the atmosphere right now. Like, there's a trillion really? tons of carbon wow. in the atmosphere, which is a lot. I don't know, a trillion tons, I don't even know how to measure that. Uh, and the soil can hold three trillion tons of carbon. And how does it do that? It's an ancient carbon capture technology that is available all over the world, that's free, free <laughs> that's uh, 
can be more effective than all the rainforests on the planet, than all the forests and trees on the planet, it's called photosynthesis. Uh -huh. And, it, and the, if you have like grasslands, for example, like we had big prairies in the United States, they suck down carbon, they breathe it, and they put it through the plants into the roots, feeds the mycorrhizal fungi, which then make healthy soil, feeds the bacteria, and you get this incredibly rich live soil that holds wow. tremendous amounts of organic matter that is carbon, right? I mean, carbohydrates comes from the word carbon, mm. which comes from carbo carbon dioxide, wow. right? Ding, 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 it all connects. And, Interesting. And so we've lost, we were so we don't have the soil for it to consume, yeah. then we, it just bounces off back into the yes. air, I guess, and just, we're just consuming yes. it in other ways. Yeah, and, and, and the soil can hold so much carbon. The UN estimated that if we took the five of the five million hectares of degraded farmland around the world, if we took just two million of that and spent 300 billion, which is the total military spend for 60 days mm -hmm. around the world, which is not much, yeah. 60 days, two months of everybody's military spending, we literally could stall climate change by 20 years wow. because of putting back, back the carbon in, in the soil. Uh, and, and not only that, it holds water. You see, mm -hmm. the, you know, in, 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 in Iowa and in the Midwest, did. There was floods that just destroyed a million acres of cropland that otherwise could have been fine if the soil could hold the water, but it just sits on the top where it runs through and we lose all this water. So that when you have a organic matter in the soil, it holds 27,000 gallons for every 1% organic matter in the soil per acre. So it's, it's an incredible water sink, it's a carbon sink, and we've lost all these soils and it's because we're growing these commodity crops in ways that destroy soil. soil. We're tilling gotcha. the soil, we're turning over cause soil erosion, it runs off into the rivers, uh, it, it, we kill all the life in the organic matter by poisoning it with fertilizer, right. with pesticides, with uh, glyphosate, herbicides, and, and it's, it's staggering. And then we have all these sort of unintended consequences. You know, we, we started growing all this food and we thought this agricultural revolution was great, all these chemicals are great, you know, fertilizer's great, we can do all this good stuff, tractors, big farms, more food, right. feed the world. Uh, it's backfired on us. Wow. And it's producing the worst food on the planet that's causing devastating environmental damage, staggering climate change. So it's, it's the soil loss, it's, you said, add the deforestation, it's the factory farming of animals, which is, should be banned. <laughs> right. It's the transportation, storage, refrigeration, and the food waste. I mean, food waste in a lot of waste. Yeah, but, well, we we waste forty percent of our food. We really throw That's on our plate. We don't ma eat imagine it. going to the grocery store, buying a bunch of groceries, take, and getting home and throwing forty percent of the garbage. The average Americans waste eighteen hundred dollars of food a year, and it's about a pound a day, uh, and that goes to landfills. The landfills then it rots and creates methane. So you could be a vegan, throwing out your food waste and scraps, and you could be contributing to climate change, if. Food waste for our country, it would be the third largest emitter of greenhouse gases after the US and China. Wow. Yeah, it's methane to produce. Uh, and, and we need to compost, we need to have community garden, like it's always to fix it. But it's, it's like when you look at the whole end-to-end -end food system, it is the number one source of climate change, about 50% of greenhouse gases. And people just don't appreciate that. So why, I mean, if this information is public and it's out there and policy makers are aware of it. They're not. They're not, not aware of no. it. No. I, I spent two hours on a sailboat this summer with a senator, a smart senator. He wasn't aware of it. And I, I literally, his jaw was hanging open the entire time. Are they not presented with this research and no. information? No. Because they got so much money sent to them by well, the lobbyists probably. Right. I mean, listen, if all the people who are walking their office are Monsanto and Cargill and, you know, McDonald's and Pepsi nice. and like, and they're all donating millions of dollars, I would say billions of dollars. Um, they're not hearing the other side of the science, and you know how do you how do you fight that? So you know I, I always did deride it lobbyists, but I, I plan on you know I'm creating a food fix campaign, which is a nonprofit, along with an advocacy organization to start to literally lobby senators, congressmen, wow. key people in the administration around these issues, and start to drive policy change. Because in the UK, and you were talking about I think in Australia, New Zealand, there, or in I think in Asia, you were saying that. You can't do certain things with the food, otherwise you'll go to prison. You'll go to, you know, you'll get killed. Yeah. You'll well, yeah. I mean, like in the UK, mean, you can, they don't have a lot of these dyes and right. You know, right. Yeah. So it's so funny, you know. And the FDA, you know, is so influenced by the the food industry. Um, and and I was once with the uh, the, the former uh, head of the Federal Drug Administration, Food and Drug Administration, 
uh, Peggy Hamper, former. former. She, she was, she was, you know, she, but then she was the FDA commissioner. Yeah. yeah. Um, but but now she's former. And I was at the World Economic Forum. I said, Peggy, how how come um, you know we have uh, so much trouble with with getting advances in food labeling or dealing with toxic uh -huh. chemicals in our food or antibiotics in animal feed or you know it's like she's like well uh, when we try to make too aggressive change Congress threatens to shut down our funding because of the food lobby they threaten to f shut it down yeah and then what if Just, they shut it down what would happen well they, they they're limited in their ability to do their job oh, and so man. the FTC the same thing happened in the 70s there was a movement by the Federal Trade Commission to have uh, you know negative, edu I mean, I mean, education campaigns around sugar and how bad it was, but the Congress says we're going to pull all your funding and shut you down if you if you do this, and so they pull back. So, so uh, yes. you know, in in the, you know, for example, you asked a question about Asia, uh, we have this thing called grass, which is generally recognized as safe. So the food additives, we have you know we have you know thousands of food additives. Um, only about 5% have actually been tested for safety. In the US. Some of them are grandfathered in, right? Like, so Crisco, for example, trans fat was grandfathered in as a safe food to eat. But it took 50 years for researchers to finally prove to the FDA that it wasn't safe because wow. it was the basis of all processed food, oh. right? Crisco shortening, you know, shortened your life. <laughs> oh my shortening. gosh. And, and so they, they, they literally had to be sued by a scientist in order to actually turn it into a non safe substance. And then, they, of course, they gave their food industry years and years to get it out of food. So, right. but, but, but in this country, there's so many things that are used in our food supply that are banned in Europe, like BHT, butylated hydroxytoluene food additives, uh, various dyes, and something called azodicarbonamide, which is a th softener that makes like bread more like fluffy and soft. Yeah, yeah. And it was used in Subway sandwich. Our friend Vani Hari outed them and said, "This is your yoga mat material in your Subway sandwich." And they got to take out. Pretended right? to eat her. Yeah, and she got it out. But the FDA still says it's fine to eat. Right. And in Singapore, if you use it and you're a food producer, you get a four hundred fifty thousand dollar fine and fifteen years in jail for putting it in the food. That same ingredient. The same ingredient that anyone can use in the U.S. Right. In the now. U.S. Yes. And most of the things that are safe, quote, safe here, are banned in Europe. So it's like, yeah, they're not doing their job. And then antibiotics, you know, we have 30 million pounds of antibiotics are used in animal feed, we have about 37 million total. So about 7 million for humans to treat disease and 30 million for animals, why? For growth, it's a growth factor. Right. It makes them fat and it makes humans fat too. And it is used for prevention of, from overcrowding. And, and the FDA says, well, this isn't a good idea. I mean, nobody thinks it's a good idea. Mm -hmm. um, but they go, well, would you please, pretty please not do it? It was a voluntary guideline that the FDA produced, not mandatory. Please don't do it, yeah. You have to have a vet certify that the animal's sick before you give them antibiotics. Oh, man. And now they, they, they you know, continue to do it and just laugh. You know, they had voluntary, the, 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 the um, FDA, uh, FTC put in voluntary guidelines around junk food marketing. Would you pretty please not advertise <laughs> the bad stuff and advertise more good stuff? It was just voluntary and the food industry went ballistic and had it overturned. So even the voluntary guidelines are nullified. Like, no, wow. Mm. And it just, it's- I it, mean, sugar, I mean, it's like, I'm the first one to raise my hand when I say like, I love sugar and it's my, everybody my biggest does. vice, right? Everybody like I does. love cookies and candies and cakes and brownies and anything you can think of, I love it, right? You know, we, we programmed I don't know sugar. why I don't have diabetes. So much sugar I've had in my whole life. But you I can't be having that much because you look pretty good. <laughs> well, I train hard too, right? I go through waves. And, but as a kid, I would drink like nine, 10 Dr. Peppers a day, I remember. What? Like some days in the summer, you're just sitting you around. You could have been president. It's not what I was. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I would just, I mean, I would run around and, and work out and play sports, but then yeah. I would just drink because yeah. I thought that's but what was eight, on TV. You were 16, 18. You're like, and I was like nine, 10, right? So oh. I was like, but it was. You'd see it on commercials like your NBA superstar yeah. drinking Dr. Yeah. Pepper or Sprite yeah. or whatever after on the basketball court. And I don't know if it was just like subconscious or just it tasted good and you didn't think about it. it well, was just, they, all about, I mean, this is where the food industry is so, I mean, I talk about it in my book, Food Facts, but the yeah. food industry is so strategic about how it advances its mission and goals. And it does it through multiple channels. And I, I'm just going to go through them because it's just people just don't know. The celebrity first, endorsements, right? Yeah, the first, you know, obviously, you know, celebrity endorsements, which is the obvious one. 
they co-opt social groups. So they, they fund mm -hmm. groups like the NAACP and Hispanic Federation. The you know, African American and Latino communities are the most affected by diabetes mm -hmm. and obesity. And they co-opt them by funding them. I, I want to show the movie Fed Up at yeah. the King Center in Atlanta. And Bernice King, Martin Luther King's daughter, was all about it and she was excited. But once, uh, once we got it scheduled a few days later, I got a call that we couldn't show it. I'm like, why? She's because Coca-Cola funds the King Center. No. Yeah. I went to Spelman College, you know, which is African American Women College in Atlanta, and the dean said to me, half of the 18-year-olds coming into college have a chronic illness: mm. obesity, hypertension, diabetes. 18-year-old women, and I'm like, why is there soda machines all over the campus? Why? It's just because Coke funds. No. And one of the wow. one of the people on the board of trustees is one of the highest executives at Coca-Cola. Coca oh man, an African American woman. It's like so they co-opt social groups. And that's why they, for example, oppose soda taxes because they're they're in the you know in the funding of these these big soda companies, and then of course they, they fund research. So they fund twelve times as much research, twelve billion dollars worth of research a year to study nutrition. So Gatorade gets studied by Pepsi. <laughs> and really, Gatorade's the best thing in the world. It's not. It's just sugar, right? Or right. you know, <laughs> right, right. So er, they, it corrupts and pollutes science. So people are confused. Why is there so much confusion about nutrition science? Third, they, they, they create front groups, they call them spin doctors. So they create front groups that seem like they're independent groups, like Crop Life, yeah. or you know, like they're tweeting the Center out. for Consumer Freedom, right. or the American Council on uh, Science and Health, which by the way is uh, run by a bunch of doctors who suggest that uh, pesticides are safe, that high fructose corn is great for you, that uh, smoking isn't cause disease, and you know. <laughs> why, like, do they do, why would they and, do that? Because they get paid a lot? They're funded by Monsanto and Big Food and Pepsi. You just look at their funders. And they're, I mean, they spent $30 million fighting GMO labeling in California, this wow. front group. But it was all funded by Monsanto, right? And then you, so you got these front groups. And then you have um, them co opting scientists and academies. So the Nutrition Academies, the American Heart Association, American Diabetes Association, their funding in large part comes from industry. And, and so the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics, which is our main nutrition association, 40% of their funding comes from the food industry. Mm. You know, they, they have sponsored, you know, lectures at their meetings that are, you know, with people saying, well, high fructose corn syrup is good and diet drinks are good and like, right. it's just completely corrupted. And so these professional societies give guidelines and they're, they're corrupt. And Dr. Ioannidis from Stanford, who's a, an epidemi a scientist who looks at carefully at the research and, and conflicts of interest says, you know, the, these professional societies like the American Heart Association and Diabetes Association should not be making guidelines. And then, so you've got all these ways in which they sort of screw things up. And then, of course, they, they are aggressive in advertising and marketing, which mm -hmm. is illegal in most countries. And then they have lobbyists running around Washington driving policy that supports all of what they do. So you, the, you've got this massive effort, and, and it's often subversive and illegal. And they, it's, you know, it's kind of shady. Yeah. I mean, here's an example. Like in California, there was a group that, um, you know, wanted to have uh, anti, was, was to, to promote GMO labeling. Uh -huh. And they put in a ballot on the, um, What does that mean, promote GMO labeling? So that, that you have to label, if you have a food that has GMO in it, you have you to have label to put it. it. Yeah. So on a can of Coca-Cola, it would say GMO right. corn. Right. Kind of like in a cigarette right. box where it says, like, this will kill right. you. Right. And your, and your <laughs> plant-based burger would have to say GMO burger. Right, mm, right. So, um, the food industry didn't like that. Right. So the grocery well, manufacturer of America got together because it would really cost them, you know, huge amounts of money. People were aware of this stuff; they don't want to. They stopped buying it. Yeah. yeah. And by well, the way, why don't um, they label it though? That seems like the smart well, thing to by do. By the way, most countries do have it. Really? Um, like I think thirty to fifty countries have it, including China and Russia, who are not, which are not known for transparency or democracy, right? So and we and they don't and it's it's terrible. So so they basically <laughs> tried to put this thing. Now the food industry got together with the grocery manufacturer America, which is their trade group, and they're like, we can't have this. So they spent like millions and millions of dollars fighting this ballot. And the way they did it was illegal wow. because they got the food companies to donate in a way where it should be transparent for campaign finance. You have to be all transparent. It was all secret. They got caught. Uh, the grocery manufacturers of America got fined. $18 million, which is the largest fine ever for an mm. infraction for campaign finance violations. But they appealed it and it was down to $6 million and they appealed it. But it's like, 
and, and of course the ballot, because they did all that work, it didn't pass. Mm -hmm. So they were successful. So what's a few million dollars when they have billions at stake? So they're so corrupt. And then, they, and then in California, it was even worse. There were four soda taxes passed here uh, in the 2016 election in, you know, in many states. Soda tax in many is states. Passed. It's soda tax, uh -huh. right? So you pay an extra penny an ounce or whatever for, for sugar sweet and drink, which, by the way, it's been proven to re reduce consumption yeah. dramatically. It works. That's why people do right. it. And it works, and that's why the food industry is so against it. So what the American Beverage Association, which used to be called the American Soda Pop Association did, was they took, <laughs> this is crazy, they, they created a ballot measure to prohibit any local taxes from being passed unless there was a two-thirds majority, mm. which would mean that you couldn't fund schools, police stations, fire stations, local stuff, and it would have crippled local governments all across the state. And it had nothing to do with food. But mm -hmm. then they went at the last minute before it was about to pass, and they spent millions pushing this. They went to Governor Jerry Brown, the most liberal governor we've probably ever had in America, Governor Moonbeam, they used to call him. And they're like, look, you pull this, um, you, you pass this preemptive law, which means you can never pass another soda tax in California, and we'll pull this ballot measure. So basically, they got Governor Brown to pass this preemptive law, which means that you're not allowed to go and pass another soda tax in California. Why? Why? Because they don't want soda taxes. It's crazy. It's crazy. And why did Governor Brown do it? Because he didn't want his entire state, local governments to be crippled oh. by this new ballot measure that was about to pass. So it was all done behind closed doors. You can never tax days. again? You can't now in California. You can't? No. And they're doing these states can all- Can you change the law? Back? You could. It you just could. take more effort you and energy. They're going to have to, you know, but they're doing this in states all across oh the country. Gosh. And it's a, it's the playbook that the tobacco industry used. Wasn't well, tobacco? I mean, isn't cigarettes have a tax on them now, or in some they do. states? They do. Oh, like there was a huge lawsuit that's that sort of changed everything, right? There was huge litigation and multi-billion-dollar settlements and all kinds of restrictions wow. that did happen. But food is more complicated because it's not cigarette is one thing. It's like yeah. soda. It's processed food. It's everything. So, so this is all the bad news. The wow. good news is that you know, we can fix these problems. We, we can reverse climate change. We can reverse chronic disease. We can fix these dysfunctional food policies. We can, and some of the social injustice issues which we didn't talk about is related to food. We can uh, actually help save our economy if we change the way we grow food, the way we process food, the way we distribute, market, market it, eat yeah. it, and waste it. And we can do that. We, it's not like we need to invent some new technology. We have the ability to do it, we know what to do, the science is there. It just is gonna take a grassroots movement and some political pressure to do it. What would be the first steps that someone could take to help? Well, I think, you know, in it my seems book, like such a big, it is, it is. It's a, a little big. So, so let's talk about some of the solutions. So we know, you know, food is causing chronic disease, it's destroying our economy, it's crippling climate our change, climate, yeah. it's, it's destroying our environment, and killing all the pollinators and all biodiversity, and it's, causing social injustice because it targets poor minorities who suffer from problems. It, it prevents kids from learning in school because mm -hmm. they're eating all this crap. It threatens our national security. It creates political instability. So we know all these things. But the good news is that by fixing the food system, we can solve these. And how yeah. do we do it? Well, it's going to need citizen action. It's going to need business innovation. And it's going to need policy change. And of course, yeah. other philanthropists and governments to help get on board. And I think that's what's really exciting to me because there's so much hope. So, so for example, on a personal level, you can shift what you eat and what you do to drive change in the marketplace. Why are companies like Nestle and Unilever and Danone creating regenerative ag programs within their supply chain? Why are they trying to up, up mm. uh, the quality of their food and take out chemicals? Because right. consumers are demanding it. Well, they're Why buying. Is, they're buying companies like Primal Kitchen. Yeah, that have like like healthy. Kraft, right? Bought Primal Kitchen, which is basically a you know Whole Foods, you know, uh, really high quality, nutritious product with no junk in it. Exactly. Right. So, so there, there's and yes, th that's part of the problem. They're buying up these companies, <laughs> but I think they're seeing the change, and there's there's a positive change. Mm -hmm. I mean, General Mills just committed a million acres to regenerative agriculture. That's incredible. Mm -hmm. That happened because people are demanding different things yeah. by, by voting with their fork, yeah. voting with their wallet. And I think we can also do things like join community support agriculture uh, associations, which gets food delivered to your house from a local farm. You can mm -hmm. shop at farmer's markets. You can use a company like Thrive Market that sources regeneratively raised products or Mariposa Ranch where you can buy direct mm -hmm. 
from the ranch we generally raise meats uh, you can you can actually start a compost pile which will help end food waste because we don't throw out all our scraps and you can if you live in an apartment like this you can still have an in apartment little composting really? bucket that then you can take to you know local compost place interesting in some some states uh, like in california and san francisco uh mayor newsom who's now governor mandated composting mm. so you go to the airport in san francisco y y there's a compost bucket there wow that's you cool know, there's compost there's mandatory composting you can't throw your garbage in states like in, in countries like france you, if you get a fine and you can go to jail if you throw out your garbage in massachusetts they passed a uh, law that if you uh, produce more than a ton of food waste every week that you can't throw it out so it's it's now created s this side businesses mm. where whole foods and other grocery chains are giving their uh, waste to farmers and and this, these dairy farmers who are struggling to make money because dairy consumption is going down I mean it's nut milks right 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 uh, they they're they partnered with this sort of uh, venture firm I think Vanguard and they created uh, this model of, of anaerobic incinerators which essentially is a as a digester an anaerobic digester mm. where they throw in the food waste they throw in some cow manure from the farm and it produces energy that, mm. that, that creates wow. electricity for 1500 homes wow. from this one farm <laughs> in Europe there's 17,000 of these anaerobic digesters we should mandate that nationally sure. so so you can actually do something good with your waste so there's a lot of things we can do you can you can actually be an activist in your mm -hmm. schools uh, I know mm -hmm. so many people around the country who've been activists in their schools and get yeah. their school food changed. And it can be so done in the school food. nutrition guidelines. It can be done within budget. Uh, there's a group called Conscious Kitchens, which it creates a template for schools to do this. Mm -hmm. There's something called My Way Cafe in Boston, where they've done this at scale. So there's so many opportunities for really about. In your workplace, you can be an activist and say, let's get the soda out of here. I mean, yeah. uh, universities, Cleveland Clinic was one of the first to get all sugar sweetened beverages out. Uh, and there's University of California, San Francisco. Isn't it crazy that hospitals used to have? Oh my God! McDonald's. I mean, still do have like all the vending machines with uh, sugar and candy. Yeah. With sick patients. That... Oh my God! Yeah. When I when I, I mean when I went to uh, when I was working in the inner city hospital in Springfield, Massachusetts, as an ER doc, I literally like you know working hard. You don't always have time to go because the cafeteria is over eight you to nine, grab something real and quick. twelve to one, and six to seven. So like the only thing that was open from six a.m. to two a.m was McDonald's yeah. <laughs> and I would go get the burrito thing because I was a little healthier sure. but it was like it was terrible and and you know so so there's a lot of things that institutions can do there's something called yeah. the good food purchasing program where institutions can can buy food in ways that are good for their employees mm. that are good for the animals that are raised in you know yeah. humane sustainable yeah. ways that are good for the climate and so forth uh, good for the farm workers so a lot of things that people can do, and I, I have a whole action guide. If you go to foodfixbook.com, which is where you can find out about the book, you can pre-order it. You also get an entire action guide that guides you through all the things that you mm. can do in your own life. And then, of course, you can vote with your vote. Uh, you know, people are so apathetic when it comes to politics, and we live in a democracy. We take it for granted. Yeah. You know, it, you can change it by voting. You can because it matters. You know, mm. and I think 50% of people don't vote. And often people vote who might have different values than you and you think it doesn't matter. And it does matter. I mean, you, you know, I, I had it work for me at Cleveland Clinic, this young African-American woman, you know, who, who grew up, you know, very poor. And I said, why are you voting? She goes, no, I'm not going to vote. I'm like, why aren't you going to vote? She says, it doesn't matter. It's like irrelevant. Mm. But, you know, we look at, look at what happened in Alabama. The African-American women in Alabama went out to vote and they voted for a Democrat and that was like I don't know when the last time they had a Democrat yeah. in Alabama was, yeah. because they stood up and asked for you know, something different. Change. Wow! So there's a there's a great website called foodpolicyaction.org, where you can look at your congressman and senator, what their voting record is on food and ag policy, wow. and then you can write to them. There's all mechanisms for for being activists to communicate, and uh, they even ousted two congressmen who were in the pocket of big food by a big, big social media campaign based on on using citizen activism. I and mean, that's how things happen, right? Mm -hmm. We think we don't, our voice doesn't matter, but look at what happened, look at abolition, right? Our entire economy, our entire agricultural system was based on slavery. It ended. Women's vote, you know, it, it, women got the vote because they stood up and said, hey, mm -hmm. it took, you know, another 50 years to get civil rights. Civil, I mean, civil, I mean women's, uh, women's rights, but civil rights, same yeah. thing. Gay rights, same thing. You know, it didn't start in Congress, it ended in Congress. Right? Mm -hmm. So we need to actually create a grassroots efforts and everybody needs to be empowered to do this. And that's really what the book is about. Yeah. And then of course we need business innovation, right? Like these anaerobic incinerators. It solves food waste, it solves the methane from the cow poop, 
It solves right. the economic issues of farmers because they make 100 grand a year, and it produces renewable energy and electricity out of poop and garbage. It's pretty amazing. <laughs> so it's pretty like cool. a lot. So there's all kinds of great business things that are happening. There's, yeah. a, there's a company called, uh, I think it's a private equity group called Private, uh, it's called Farmland LP. And basically they buy up uh, conventional farms, they convert them to regenerative farms, and which basically restores the soil like we talked mm -hmm. about. And they turn the, the profits from single digits to more than double digits. So their, their first fund had a 67% profit. Mm. And then there's this thing they call ecosystem services. So every year we use up natural capital. Right? We, we take out resources from the earth, uh, plants, biodiversity, uh, mineral, everything, right? Soil, water. And we use up about $125 trillion a year of natural capital, which is about $40, mil, 40 trillion more than the global economy, right? Wow. Um, and most of the way we farm now depletes our natural capital. Right? With conventional farming, destroys the soil, water, pesticides, mm -hmm. chemicals, pollinators, species, blah, blah, blah. Chronic disease, <laughs> they create regenerative farms, which, which actually put in $21 million of benefit to the environment, whereas the uh, conventional farms will, in the same amount of farming, will take out $8 million worth of benefit. Wow. So it's a win-win-win. And you know, there's this farmer in, um, you know, in, in North, Carolina, North Dakota, who had Gabe Brown, who had his farm decimated by hail and bad weather, mm -hmm. and, uh, and was about to go bankrupt. And he started researching and found about regenerative ag, and he started to convert his 5,000 acre farm in North Dakota to regenerative ag. And now he's built 29 inches of soil. He doesn't need water. He doesn't use pesticides, fertilizers, chemicals. He produces more food on the same land. It's a very diverse set of crops that, that restores ecosystems, restores pollinators, restores the soil organic matter. Uh, and and he makes 20 times the amount of money mm. as his neighbor <laughs> and produces more food, better food, with less inputs in ways that restore the environment. Mm. So this is a scalable thing. He's innovating, yeah. Yeah, he's innovating. And yeah. I think this is a model that needs to be grown. Uh, and yes, we need incentives from the government. We need business investments mm -hmm. like these guys from Farmland LP. So whatever, whatever way we need to do it. And then, of course, we need government policy change. And that's the hardest part, right? Because, yeah. you know, people go, oh, Washington, it's a shit show and... You know, nothing's going to change. Yeah. I'm just, I give up, and like it's just. But you know, there is, there are things getting done, and there, and there is a way to change things. And 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 the people you elect do care about getting reelected, mm -hmm. and they want your vote. And if they know that you care about stuff, they will change things. They'll change it. They will change things. They want to be in power. Yes, they want to. They want to stay there. So we 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 can actually be active. And and I'm working with a group that um, is a incredible strategy group that launched Bono's One Campaign, mm -hmm. which was raised about $100 billion through congressional appropriations for AIDS and poverty relief, Democrat, Republican, bipartisan effort. And they know how to make sausage in Washington. And I'm working with this crew, and we're raising money to actually change the policies that matter. You know, we need to start supporting Regenerative Act. We need to implement policies that create food as medicine to treat mm -hmm. chronic disease. We need to get rid of the dysfunctional food policies like food stamps, which you know, pays for seven billion in soda. <laughs> and, it's horrible. You know, it's yeah. like, you know, we need to get school lunches better. We need to end all the food marketing to kids. And, and these things are not going to be easy. We need better food labels so people know yeah. what the heck they're eating instead of like, right. you know, it says 40 grams of sugar. Nobody knows that's 10 teaspoons, you know? So like, there's so many things we can do and, I'm, and we're working on a very focused strategy. I'm super excited because, you know, one, unless you identify the problem, you know, you can't fix it. Can't and fix two, it. once you do, you can mobilize grassroots, you can, you know, pressure congressmen and senators, you can do all sorts of things to change policy. And I, yeah. I think it's got to happen here, it's got to happen globally. It's a global problem. Yeah, it's huge. Um, so they can get the Sorry, board. I get carried away. I no, it's great, keep man. Keep going here on my monologue. You got all your, the resources and the information on this at foodfixbook.com. Right? Yes. So they can go there, they can get free downloads, yeah. they can buy the book there. I'm curious, you said something about nut milk. Uh, and about dairy. Yeah. Dairy, has dairy been declining? Yeah, dairy. In the last five yes, years? Yes, dairy consumption you know the, has been declining dramatically. Do you know the percentages uh, or the... It's like, yeah, I think, you know, over the last few years, like it's gone down about 25%. Borden, uh, which is a big milk producer, has been around since 18, I think 87, has gone bankrupt. What? Yeah. The, the lot of, and the, the, a lot of these milk, milk producers, now people are still eating cheese, they're eating yeah. yogurt, they're eating things, but, but actual milk, uh, consumption has gone down and the is nut that, milks have gone up. Why is that? Is that I because think, of education? Is that because I of think, disease? You know, that... <laughs> I think probably a lot of reasons. I mean, 75% <clears throat> of the population is lactose intolerant. Yeah. So they don't feel good. 
Uh, I used to drink so much milk every day. And gym. how did you feel? Fine? I always had like a stuffy nose. Right, right. <laughs> like I was always tired in workouts and practices. Yeah. Like yeah. I was always blowing my nose. Yeah. Well, uh, it's actually, milk is nature's perfect food, but only if you're a cat. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, we're the only species that consumes milk after weaning. Yeah. Uh, there are very few populations that seem to thrive on milk, the Maasai and some of the Northern Europeans. The other problem with the dairy we're eating today is not the dairy we ate, right? So there are heirloom cows. I mean, you travel around the world, you travel, I travel, mm -hmm. and you go see these really weird looking cows in other countries. I'm like, what is that? And it's a cow. <laughs> right. But these are uh, you know, complex breeds that have different types of protein in the milk, mm. different types of casein. And the, the Holstein, the sort of the homogenized cow, I don't mean homogenized milk, but they're, everything, they're all the same. Not the And they're fertilized by like the yeah. three bulls, I think. They get the, you know, right. like the sperm from three bulls. And it's like, they're all the same. And they have bred out the beneficial mm. or the safe casein, which is A2 casein, and then A1 casein, which causes more inflammation, more congestion, more irritable bowel, more autoimmunity, more skin issues. So wow. uh, people are getting that milk isn't always the best. And, and I think then, you know, people are eating nut nuts. Now, they're not completely... Are those, are those good for you, though? Because a lot of people have still, like, yeah. skin problems. Yeah, and... well, nut milks are problematic. So, uh, <laughs> one, almond milk is great, but, you know, almonds are... But you can't have too much of it. Yeah. I started to get, like, a rash after I had... Yeah. Like, I switched from milk yeah. years ago, and I started to get, like eczema like a little eczema yeah, here yeah, and there yeah, yeah. and then when i stopped drinking it it would go away and yeah. i was like huh maybe i'm drinking well, so much almond of, butter almond milk well a lot everything. of them had carrageenan in it which uh, is causes leaky gut uh, you get leaky gut you get eczema so it's a thickener uh, they put in into these milks they put a lot of sugar in these milks they put right. a lot of gums in these milks so you have to be very careful about which one you're having and just because it's healthier doesn't mean it's it healthier. Right. Yeah, and I, you know, I don't want to like again drinking tons of soy milk. It could be GMO soy. It could be right. full of glyphosate. If not, it could be you know, you know, getting huge amounts of these phytoestrogens, which where bodies aren't really meant to get. Eating traditional foods and traditional amounts are fine. Tofu, miso, tempeh, those are fine. Really, those are how people have consumed soy over millennia. Mm -hmm. But not ten pounds a day, and not three not glasses, of, gallons. No, of I, I had a stepdaughter once. She loved soy milk, just drinking it all day, and she started like a like nine years old getting little breasts and i'm like well that's not good wow. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah and so yeah we have to be smart about it and i think you know if you're using a little here and there but i i don't recommend people drink it as a drink really you know if you want to put a little coffee almond milk or soy milk there's or macadamia milks. milk coconut milk don't drink oat it milk. no i mean i think have have it sometimes you, you have a want... glass once a week yeah. maybe it's okay but not like drinking glasses every day yeah or... probably not you know? <laughs> But you can add it to things. Sure, I, you know, put it in a smoothie. You know, you and you mix them up. You know, there's mac, macadamia milk, there's, uh -huh. uh, you know, cashew milk. There's you know hazelnut milk. There's all kinds of milks now. So, mac, uh, I like you know I like macadamia. Macadamia milk. Milk is so good. It's like yeah. sweet taste. Yeah, it's you like... can make your own nut milks. I have cookbooks. My food. What the heck should I cook? Yeah. And others teach you how to actually make your own nut milks at home. You soak the nuts. You put them in a blender with some water. There's no additives, ingredients, sugar. Uh -huh. It's great. But not too much of it is what you're saying. Yeah, not, not, yeah. That's the challenge. It's like anything, like anything. Except People for get water. Kind of, Drink a lot of water. That's yeah, I mean, it. listen, anything it can kill you, right? Water can kill you. Uh, you know, marathon runners who overhydrate, mm -hmm. uh, their body uh, is diluted, their blood is diluted with too much water, and they get what we call low sodium or hyponatremia, and that causes seizures and death. So yeah, you can die from drinking too much water. So it's all about like eating stuff in complex amounts mm -hmm. and in a complex variety of foods. So a variety of food is, yeah. is good. Huge. We've seen 800 species of plants. That's good. Not having the same like three no. things every well, day. Well, hey, listen, most of our diet is, is corn, soy, yeah. and corn, soy, and wheat. Most of our diet. You know, and, and in other countries, rice in there. And, and those are, you know, all mostly turned into processed food. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we used to have, you know, like I said, 800 species of plants we ate. Now there's 12. Mm. We've lost 90% of all our edible plant species, half of all our livestock species. So We've lost them. Gone. Extinct. What do you mean? Those, those plants are gone? Gone. I mean, there are... We can't make... We can't create... There's no there seeds seed, anymore? There are seed banks that, um, that are, are there. There are seed vaults. Oh, wow, those in are Alaska. They're valuable. Like, yeah, the USDA has you know, a lot of seeds. Actually, a friend of mine um, was trying to develop different you know varieties of plants i was trying to get some old seeds and got to the usda and by accident he got a packet which was numbered like four three two one six whatever and he's like 
called him and said, what is this? Like, because he was working with an agricultural guy to grow you know, healthy food. And he goes, these are these Himalayan buckwheat, Himalayan buckwheat, which is kind of a rare buckwheat from him, the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. It grows in really rough conditions. And it's one of the most nutrient, phytochemically rich, dense foods, high protein, low starch, full of phytochemicals, vitamins and minerals mm. on the planet. <laughs> and it's and almost extinct. Pretty much. Maybe there's a few villages in Himalayas that wow. grow it. So, you know, how do we bring that back? And how do we start to create different sort of more, you know, beneficial grains? There's, there's um, uh, Kernza wheat, which has been developed by uh, uh, West Jackson out, in, uh, West Jackson out in, in, in the Midwest, which is a perennial wheat that grows roots that go, you know, you know, tens of feet into the ground, breaks up the soil, creates organic matter, and creates incredibly delicious wheat that's heirloom wheat, or not, it's, it's actually a new form, but it's, it's actually, uh, doesn't have all the gluten in it, it's more, less inflammatory, oh, yeah. less sugar. Oh man. Uh, so we need to kind of bring back some of these different kinds of foods in these complex farms that, that actually restore soil, restore yeah. human health. Oh man. Yeah. I love this. Uh, foodfixbook.com and get all the information there. They can get the book. Yeah. Your podcast has a lot of amazing information as well. If people want to learn more. Where the can Doctor's they... Pharmacy. We're, and the, pharma, the, the pharmacy. The Doctor's Pharmacy is the podcast. Yes. Doctor's Pharmacy now. And then when's the new, are you talking about the new product as well or no? No, that... we, we, you know, we can mention it. So, you know, I, 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 you know, I spent 30 years doing functional medicine and just seeing the power of food to actually heal people. And, uh, you know, people don't often don't understand how close they are to feeling good or how bad they feel. Like it could somebody, be like one or two days switch. Yeah, like I mean, what you eat. Dr. Hyman, I didn't know how bad I was feeling until I started feeling good. And I was, <laughs> I was joking, I said, people have FLC syndrome, which is when you feel like crap. Right, and well, it's just like the inflammation, the pain, the yeah. achiness, the tired. Like you said, you had congestion nose, yeah. your digestion's not right, you have a little headache, tired you're sluggish, all the time. you have yeah. brain fog, you're tired, you're achy, you don't sleep well, you have skin problems. Blurry you know? eyes. Like yeah, all stuff. that stuff. And people are like, oh, this is normal. This is just normal. Yeah. I, normal I have an arterial bowel. I have sinus issues. I'm like, my joints are a little sore. No, it's I, your food. It's what you're eating. And so for ten, in 10 days, you do a 10 day reset. And it literally like, it's like when your computer's not working, you hit mm -hmm. the reset and it reboots everything. It's like a reboot. And then you get to see within 10 days how powerfully food and Impacts reset, you. Im yes. And then you go, oh, now I can choose. Now I can feel like crap. Or I can feel great. But now I know. Yeah. And there's the a more serious form of what we call feel like crap, which is FLC syndrome, called FLS. <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and That's we, when we you are, go to the doctor. We have, yeah. we have, uh, and the first time I've ever created anything, because I really want people to have the experience, it's called, um, it's a company called Pharmacy. And you go to getpharmacy.com with an F, F-A-R-M-A-C-Y, and you can get the 10-day reset. It's a whole uh, program that's it's really integrated and it's powerful and it involves lifestyle change and diet change and the right nutrients and supplements and shakes and it's just awesome. Wow. 10 days. 10 days. Reset it. I mean, I, I even do it. You know, like I, you know, I, I came back from the holidays, you know, and I, I try to do well. <laughs> I cook Christmas dinner. I'm, I'm Jewish. Yeah. My wife's family and I made it all healthy. But, you know, when it was her mom's house, we were here, it's like, oh, a little ice cream, all this. Yeah. And I didn't go too far, but, you know, I didn't feel great. And I came back and I just did the whole 10 day reset. And it's like, I feel amazing. I mean, you don't crave bad stuff. Your energy's up. Yeah. Your sleep's better. Your joints don't hurt. Your digestion's good. I got to get know? it. Yeah. I got to get it for me and the team. Make yeah. sure we reset it. Amazing. So, um, getpharmacy.com. Yes. Uh, foodfixbook. Foodfixbook.com and your podcast. Doctor's Pharmacy. Doctor's Pharmacy. Yeah. We need everybody on the team here to fix this food system because it's an yeah. existential threat. If we don't do it, we're screwed. I mean, we're just... You know, we know the decline of the Roman Empire was mm -hmm. because of some bad stuff that was going on there. Well, our food is the decline of our empire. Really? Yeah, absolutely. Well, if we're all sick and dead, we can't yeah. do anything. I mean, yeah. I mean, we, the amount of the amount of, of disability and suffering. A lot of pain. Mental illness. Mental illness connected to food. Depression. Depression. Obesity. Chronic disease. It so limits much. our productivity, our ability to engage in life. Like, we all want to feel good. We want to have energy. Mm -hmm. We want to be able to love the people we love in our life, to do the work we want, have the mission we want, to, to be energetic and engaged. And I just want to sit around all day and binge on Netflix, right? Yeah. I mean, watching Netflix is fine, but like not in a way that avoids life because you feel yeah. so bad. Yeah. And I think uh, what's frustrating for me is, Lewis, is that I see so much needless suffering. Yeah. You know, some things we can't change. You know, we can't change, you know, natural disasters. You know, I can't, I can't end war. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is a solvable problem. Yeah, solvable. Uh, yeah. 
totally fixable. Love it. Uh, check it out. We'll link up everything below on the resource page as well. And Dr. Mark Hyman, appreciate you, man. You're the best. You. All right. Appreciate it.